Welcome back. In this video, we would be continuing our exploration of the hip flexors. In the previous video, we discussed about the psoas major extensively and here we will be discussing on the rest of the hip flexors which are the iliacus, the rectus femoris, the sartorius, the tensor facial lat. We will be picking one by one and discussing them, the biomechanics and pathomechanics of those muscles. So let us first focus on the iliacus muscle. the iliacus muscle before that i would like to request you if you haven't watched the previous video it would be better you watch the previous video and come back to this one the link is given above and if you haven't subscribed to my channel please do subscribe so that you are aware with the latest updates in our channel let us focus on the iliacus muscle yes the iliacus muscle similarly Similar to the psoas major muscle, this muscle also poses as a threat when examining and studying. The reason is, along with that psoas major muscle, this muscle is also situated deep inside our pelvic cavity. The psoas major was discussed at a deep. Um, the psoas major was there inside our abdominal cavity, deep inside the abdominal cavity, starting from 12 to thoracic vertebrae and to the L5. Whereas in the iliacus muscle, it is situated as the name suggests in the iliac fossa. So it origins from the iliac fossa. So this muscle origins from iliac fossa. All right. Along with the origin from iliac fossa, this also has in the origin from the sacroiliac joint, the lambosacral joint and so on. But we don't need to discuss that because we are not going to focus on the anatomy rather than on the biomech rather than we will be focusing on the biomechanics, right? So this unique location of the iliac muscle actually poses as a threat. We are not able to palpate deep into the iliac cavity iliac fossa sometimes the patient may not allow us on it is not easy for us to palpate and identify the iliacus in particular but definitely in the next video that is coming we are going to we are going to discuss some of the easy methods of palpation of this muscle the muscle testing the length testing etc and now similar to the psoas major muscle this muscle also has an insertion into the lesser trochanter and that is why both these muscles are together called as the iliopsoas muscle. So both of these are inserted into the lesser trochanter of the femur. Right. Now, when a muscle is inserted into the lesser trochanter, we diagnosed or we understood there was a problem which our psoas major muscle was facing. For example, if this is how this muscle femur is situated, and this is how this muscle is going to insert okay if this is the this is the joint axis this would be its momentum so we understood or we diagnosed ourselves we found out ourselves that the momentum of the iliopsoas muscle or the psoas muscle was very low psoas major was very low when momentum was low we studied that the mechanical advantage of that muscle was less Similar to that, this iliacus muscle also have a very less momentum because the insertion is same. Now, but we should aware, we are aware that these are the chief hip flexors. So, what makes this muscle the chief hip flexor? The same reason that we understood there that is a greater physiological cross sectional area, the greater PCSC. Because if you evaluate, you are going to find out that this muscle is arising from the iliac fossa, which is a large expanded place, and it is inserted into the lesser trochanter. And uh, contrary to the psoas major muscle, this muscle's fibers are even attached to the hip joint capsule. So this muscle is having a greater physiological cross section area, sometimes equal to psoas major or greater than psoas major. 
so that will compensate the loss in momentum the decrease in momentum and that makes this iliacus muscle a great or a chief hip flexor or primary hip flexor but the psoas major muscle is the most important hip flexor because of its unique location connecting the abdomen and the pelvic cavity and the femur so that is the most important or most primary hip flexor along with that this iliacus muscle is also a chief hip flexor so the first action of this muscle is hip flexion hip flexion all right what about the medial rotation we saw that if a muscle if since the psoas major is attached to the lesser trochanter and its momentum is less especially when it comes to the axis of medial rotation its momentum is very negligible and psoas major has no medial rotatory role similarly our medial rotatory role of iliacus is also absolutely zero so that is our that is iliacus has no role in medial rotation of course similar to the psoas major muscle it has a slight capability in producing lat rotation it has slight capability in producing lat rotation so if we evaluate the function this is a skip flexion and lat rotation of the hip may i ask you we studied the function of psoas major as trunk flexion no we studied it as trunk lat flexion stabilization of the lumbar vertebrae can iliacus provide that absolutely no because the iliacus is starting from the iliac cavity or iliac fossa but the other one was from the 12th thoracic vertebrae so iliacus muscle has no particular role in lumbar spine no direct role in the lumbar spine of course it has an indirect effect which we will see later and now the another function that is served by iliacus muscle is you know that the weight of head head arm and trunk is transmitted to both of your hip joints so naturally the hip joint is going to have a tendency of extension it is because the line of gravity passes slightly posterior to the hip joint so this iliopsoas muscle or the iliacus muscle provide a slight degree of help or an activity activation to prevent this hyperextension but that is not a very significant action or very prominent action it is only providing a slight degree of action in preventing hyperextension if you have a doubt in that again sense that you have a doubt in that we will understand when we diagnose or when we discuss the pathomechanics of this muscle now let us move on to the pathomechanics of this muscle pathomechanics right the pathomechanics involves two conditions one is the weakness of the muscle the other one is the tightness of this muscle what happens when your iliacus muscle is weak iliacus when the iliacus muscle is weak anybody can answer it it is going to reduce your hip flexion right it is going to reduce your hip flexion but when we see usually what we see in our clinical scenario is there is no isolated weakness of iliac muscle usually the weakness of iliac muscle is associated with the weakness of psoas major muscle so when iliacus and psoas major is weak there is a different or uh, there is a difficulty in doing day to day activities like climbing the stairs where you move from flexion to flexion or flex your knee or flex your hip or from when you are sitting in a chair or take your um, knee and place it when you are driving a car similar when you are doing activities like that when you are getting out of a tub etc and in such functional activities you will have a greater limitation when the weakness of psoas major and iliacus is identified but in normal gait that may not precipitate as much because as i told you earlier normal gait has only 38 degree of hip flexion and it may not need the proper working of this muscles the other muscles can compensate that right but if there is a complete weakness of course it can produce problems but a slight degree of weakness do not affect the gait much and now if we evaluate there are a certain particular conditions in which the psoas major muscle may be spared and iliacus is affected such as in spinal cord lesions 
the iliacus muscle is involved and so as major muscle is spared then they will have a slight degree of hip flexion difficulty right and now let us evaluate another situation when you have your iliacus muscle and psoas major muscle weak a patient approaches you for example a myasthenia patient or any other conditions and you found that the, his hip flexors are weak now when you rehab you have to rehabilitate him you feel that i have to strengthen his hip, his hip, his hip flexors only then he i can make him stand but if you train the patient for one or two days you feel you will understand yourself that the patient is able to stand straight the patient is able to stand but not in an erect stance the patient will stand something like this what is actually happening you know that is a body's compensatory mechanism the gravitational extension moment or the line of gravity is actually passing slightly posterior to your hip joint that is producing an extension moment that is producing an extension moment in your hip joint and the body has a strategy where this is utilizing that extension moment and it will go for extension it will extend your trunk it will extend your trunk and extending his trunk the patient can stand but when that trunk extension happens after a slight degree the patient may go for fall that is prevented actually in my case by my iliopsoas and uh, other hip flexors but his hip flexors are weak but we don't see him going for go to the fall we don't see him falling down why that is because you have to correlate with the ligaments we studied if you are in the ligaments we learned that the anterior capsulo ligament structures around the hip joint is very tight example or including the iliofemoral ligament the pubofemoral ligament and the capsule is very strong anteriorly and this strong capsule and the ligaments is going to contract or provide the resistance to hyperextension so this patient is purely standing with the help of his ligaments and that condition we call as hanging of the ligament hanging on the ligament the patient is literally hanging on his ligament he is not having the support of his iliopsoas muscle for contraction isome eccentric contraction to prevent the hyperextension so that is a unique situation which is often known as hanging on the ligaments hanging on ligaments hanging on ligaments Yes, the patient literally stands in hyperextension without actually help of iliopsoas muscle or the trunk extensors. He is utilizing here the gravitational extension moment and he is controlling the gravitational extension moment with his help of his passive structures. So don't think that you can rehabilitate any patient with that. For example, a patient is going for a three months bed rest or he is in a hospitalized for three months. He is having inactivity. And you start to rehabilitate him and thinking that his capsular ligament structures is going to help you you might end up wrong that is because you have to correlate with the first chapter of biomechanics or first and second chapter of biomechanics where you learn about the soft tissue immobilization has an effect on the soft tissue it can decrease the strength of ligament tendon and the capsule so if the patient is having a prolonged immobilization beware Beware about the strength of the ligament, strength of the capsule. But of course, if there is an acute case and the patient comes to you, it's fine. You can go for this strategy for making the patient stand. This is often seen in patients in spinal cord injury, etc. You go for some uh, some orthotic help, orthotic devices like HKFO and so on to stand. Uh, up to with the knee extension, you extend the knee with the help of knee extensors. And the angle dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, you control it, and the patient is able to stand like this without the help of a support in the hip. That is actually the functional role of this advantageous strategy. Of course, it has some limitations, so that's why you have to go for HKFO and so on, and thoracolumbar orthosis and so on. That's the applied aspect. That's the next aspects which we will see in future discussions. But for the time being, that is a strategy by the body.
which is a compensatory strategy for the loss of uh, hip flexors and for the making the body in erect stance that is known as the hanging on the ligaments these are the two situations in which the iliacus muscle can be weak and it can precipitate the problems like this right and now what happens if the iliacus muscle is tight the tightness of iliacus muscle definitely the tightness of this muscle is going to reduce your hip extension right when this is contracting from here it cannot go for the hip extension so tightness the first thing it is going to reduce your hip extension but not just that it's going to have some other consequence let us see that you know that this is your pelvis and this is your femur the iliacus muscle which has a great span of insertion like this let my hand shows the iliacus muscle and now when the iliacus muscle is contracting see when iliacus muscle is tight it can actually pull your pelvis anteriorly the pulling of your pelvis anteriorly the anterior superior iliac spine is coming anteriorly and that condition is known as anterior tilt of the pelvis so anterior pelvic tilt is a consequence of this excessive tightness of iliacus as well as the psoas major muscle most probably due to the iliacus tightness so when in that patient there is an anterior pelvic tilt when the iliacus muscle is tight what happens when there is an anterior pelvic tilt the problem here is just an anterior pelvic tilt anterior tilt right this anterior tilt of the pelvis is going to have two consequences one is lumbar lordosis increased lumbar lordosis so we discussed this in uh, the discussion with the psoas major actually when the patient if the patient is able to have his trunk motion like flexion extension lateral flexion or rotation that is the flexibility in his trunk and lumbar spine is perfect this anterior tilt of the pelvis is going to be compensated by hyperextension at the lumbar spine and that will increase your lordosis at the lumbar spine that will increase your lordosis at the lumbar spine so in patients with anterior pelvic tilt there is a greater chance of having increased lumbar lordosis that is actually body's defense strategy to make your head erect and always look in the horizon that is actually the body's defense strategy so that can happen in anterior pelvic tilt in patients who have a greater amount of trunk flexibility and i have discussed earlier if the trunk flexibility is decreased such as in a sedentary people or old age people what can happen what can happen it can result in a condition where your abdomen is going to protrude and your lumbar spine is going to be straight that means from here there is a protrusion and and as a result of this mostly your lumbar spine goes for flattening of the lumbar spine so two situations can occur in anterior pelvic tilt one is increased lumbar lordosis second one is flattening of the lumbar lordosis what happens when there is an increased lordosis can you specify which structure in your spine is going to be affected the most is it the transverse process is it the spinous process is it the lamina is it the articular process or it's a vertebrate body that is going to have the greatest wear and tear when the lumbar lordosis is happening when lumbar lordosis is happening what happens is that you have your lumbar vertebrae here right not the transverse process not the spinous process but you are articular process superior and inferior articular processes over here this articular process is going to have the greatest compressive effect or greatest wear and tear that is your two superior articular facet upwards and your two superior and inferior articular facet is going to have going to bear the greatest amount of compressive load and that result in the pathological condition known as the facet joint pathology
that result in that may result in facet joint pathology in the lumbar spine right and when this low dose is, is not going to increase and the lumbar spine is going for flattening what happens is that this weight bearing or the compressive load on the facet joint is going to decrease and it is going to be bared by your vertebral bodies and the intervertebral disc that will induce or that will produce the degeneration of your spine vertebra the degeneration of intervertebral disc so that can produce situation known as iv disc or intervertebral disc degeneration see two different entities are being produced by the same anterior pelvic tilt in two different kinds of persons in persons with the lumbar flexibility it can reduce produce facet joint pathology in persons with a straight spine and less flexibility it can produce iv disc and my dear friends you are going to treat we are going to treat a patient with a lumbar pathology we have diagnosis it's lumbar pathology we do all the modalities we do all the release and we do all the strengthening exercise but we are not able to get the 90 percentage 100 percentage results something is preventing that that may be your tightness in your iliac muscle that may be your tightness in psoas major muscle that tightness is going to actually tilt your pelvis anteriorly and whenever you are going to give the patient some relief actually what is happening the compressive load on the spine is going on increasing when the psoas major muscle is working it is increasing the compressive load on the muscle when there is an increased lordosis it's going to have it's going to precipitate by face joint pathology so you need to look deep into the physical condition of the patient because the body is a kinetic chain every single no single joint or no single part of the body functioning alone it actually functions as a part of a complete chain and one problem one single knot in the chain can precipitate problem in other so if you want to rehabilitate completely or if you do not get complete rehabilitation look into that chain somewhere some problems may be there along with that lumbar spine pathologies and all the low back pain modalities and treatment and strategies look into his pelvis look into his iliacus muscle look into his psoas muscle palpate it test it isolate uh, isolate it do isolatory testers and understand its power check whether it is tight check if you need to have the stretching of that simply don't go for the stretching of the muscle simply don't go for strengthening of the muscle because always remember the chain is in the related and chain can precipitate problems right yes and this um yes next let us move on to the rectus femoris muscle rectus femoris muscle before that let me show you some few diagrams of uh, the iliac muscle this diagram is showing the origin of iliacus muscle which is completely arising from the iliac fossa almost complete surface of the iliac fossa and is inserted as a strip into the glacier trochanter along with the insertion of psoas major and this shows the relationship between psoas major iliacus and psoas minor iliacus of course you can see the large physiological cross section area of iliacus muscle which is sometimes equal to or greater than that of the psoas major muscle and both of them as you as shown in the figure is inserted into the lesser trochanter of the femur and here you can see which we discussed earlier the hanging on the ligaments here the patient is actually having weakness of iliacus and psoas or iliopsoas and but he is able to stand straight that is with the help of the ligaments which actually counterbalance or act against the gravitational extension moment which helps the patient to actually stand in hyperextension but he is not going for a fall that is actually because of the anterior capsular ligament structures iliofemoral ligament pubofemoral ligament and the capsule of the hip joint which is actually providing the check against this posterior translation posterior hyperextension of the 
keep joint so even though there is a weakness of iliacus and psoas major muscle the patient is able to stand by utilizing the gravitational extension moment which is a natural compensatory mechanism and this is about the two difference that can happen in case of uh, the tightness of uh, iliacus psoas muscle when there is a tightness in a flexible person who has lumbar spine flexibility as shown in the left diagram of that lady that is going to increase the lumbar lordosis because it's going to pull the pelvis anteriorly and but in order to maintain the gaze on the horizon the body is actually going for hyperextension at the lumbar spine and that is shown in the figure but in case of an old age person who has lumbar spine less mobility the lumbar lordosis is minimized or attenuated because the hip flexors protrudes the or pulls the abdomen towards its, its itself towards the pelvic cavity and hence the lumbar spine arrangement get changed and the lumbar spine becomes straight like uh, um, by losing the lumbar lordosis because those thing actually when we discuss that there is increased lordosis and sometimes there is an attenuation of the lordosis that is increased flattening this is actually coming under the hip flexion contraction i told you that is the iliac muscles or iliacus or psoas major is actually going to be tight now this can occur actually in two manner one is contralateral both side it can be tight okay Uh, bilateral tightness, not contralateral. Bilateral tightness. Let me write this correctly. Yes. That is the bilateral tightness, or it can be unilateral tightness. Bilateral tightness actually is seen in people who are sitting for a long time, like office workers, truck drivers, and then some students who sit for a long time, etc. Constantly, when you sit for a long time, after a long time, this is actually going for a slight contraction. it may not be perceptible but a slight contraction is there along with that this anterior pelvic tilt can happen and lumbar lordosis increases over a long time at the same time unilateral occurs when there is some hip pathology like arthritis some um, inflammation etc in hip this result in unilateral contraction when there is unilateral contraction there are actually two possible methods like this two possible things that is happening one is this this upper extremity or this trunk can move to the femur that is this pelvis can be tilted when the trunk is moving to the femur it is actually due to the contraction okay it is actually producing the same effect as bilateral it will produce lordosis and so on but the second one is this muscles can act this manner also this femur can move to the pelvis that is femur can move to the trunk when femur is moving to the trunk you see my fem when my femur is moving to this trunk compared to my left leg my right leg is going to get a decrease in its length a discrepancy in the length shortage in the length and now how i compensate it is actually a shortage in the length this side it is contracted so this actually not i am not able to touch the ground but i can compensate that how i can drop the pelvis in this side like i can drop the pelvis in this side i can go for uh, this is uh, normal i can go for the plantar flexion i can go for plantar flexion dropping the pelvis or i can flex even the knee a bit of knee flexion so this patient will be walking like this when there is an unilateral contraction of the hip flexors how he will be either he will be dropping the pelvis one side like this okay fine dropping the pelvis flexing the knee and going for plantar flexion that will compensate that loss in the length so that is the second thing in the hip flexion contraction if there is a unilateral contraction due to some bursitis or inflammation or some arthritic changes unilateral the patient go for a compensatory strategy that is he drop his pelvis he go for a knee flexion he go for plantar flexion which actually lengthens the shortage in the length compensate the shortage in the length it's clearly shown in the following diagram you can clearly understand with the help of that diagram yes as i told you the diagram shows a unilateral hip flexor contracture when there is a unilateral hip flexor contracture like the iliacus and psoas major it is actually going to produce a limb length changes a decrease in limb length and it is compensated by the patient by dropping the pelvis on the same side by flexing his knee on the same side or contralateral side and as well as 
placing his feet in a plantar flexed position. This compensatory mechanism actually help him in such a way to um, challenge or to compete against the decrease in length due to the movement of femur towards the pelvic cavity. The femur is pulled into the anterior pelvis or when during the anterior pelvic tilt the femur is pulled up with that hip flexor contracture and it is compensated by the body in through this following method about the rectus femoris muscle um, the challenge possessed by the psoas major and the iliacus is not here because this is uh, we can easily palpate that muscle we can easily observe it we can easily go for its muscle testing and so on so this poses a less challenge it arises from you know that anterior inferior iliac spine and the acetabular ring acetabular ring and it is inserted into the inserted the inserted with the common tendon into the tibia common tendon common quadriceps tendon into the tibia all right so this means that this is a two joint muscle all other quadriceps muscles like vastus medialis lateralis intermedius are single joint muscle this is a two joint muscle the psoas major and iliacus which we discussed earlier was two single joint muscle so our axis was direct we don't have to look for the other consequence but practice before is we cannot go for a wild guess or a, we cannot go for a direct approach because rectus femoris is a two joint muscle and every two joint muscle is going to have some problems of active and passive insufficiency. Rectus femoris function is it's going to help in the flexion of the hip and extension of the knee. You know that. So when there is a simultaneous hip flexion of the hip and extension of the knee, the muscle is at active insufficiency. The muscle cannot produce its maximum force generation when there is a simultaneous motion in both the joints. You might know what is insufficiency, but you should know the muscle is not able to actually generate its maximum potential. How far you are going to train it, how far you are going to um, isolate it and trigger it, or what you call encourage the muscle to produce more power, it is not going to do as long as the insufficiency, active insufficiency is going to exist. Similarly, when you are going for hip flexion with knee in extension, the muscle is in lengthened position. There the passive insufficiency in the muscle plays a role. That is the problem in straight leg raise, you cannot go for negative to the 90 degree. Because the length in this muscle and the length in the hamstring is going to inhibit you. Right? So, this insufficiency in the muscle is actually a problem for us. So, to produce or to get the maximum possible benefits from rectus femoris, you go for knee flexion. You know, go for knee when knee is in flexed position. The muscle is relatively free and it can generate maximum force. And when the knee is in extended position, the force generation of this muscle is going to decrease. So that you have to remember in your rehabilitative strategies. You are going to isolately strengthen this muscle. Go for this position where the muscle is in shortened position, not in lengthened position. Where there is no inefficiency, insufficiency of this muscle. That is the most important aspect of rectus femoris. So the rectus femoris is an important hip flexor. It is a primary hip flexor. It is a two joint muscle. The only possible a disadvantage that the muscle is having is that it is unable to produce the maximum force generation when there is the simultaneous action in that hip and knee joint. You want to have this isolated, simultaneous, uh, isolated, full force contraction of the rectus, go for flexion of the knee, which enable the muscle to produce the maximum capable force generation. That is the applied aspect of uh, rectus femoris muscle right and of course when the rectus femoris muscle is weak what can happen you know that what can happen the extension of the knee is going to lose and you can go for the buckling if the rectus is weak at the hip of course it can reduce the capability of hip flexion but sometimes and mostly your iliacus and psoas is going to take up that
full flexion at possible range may not be possible but of course flexion may not be affected but it's most going to be precipitated in your knee joint so we will study in depth about the mechanics and biomechanics of the rectus femoris in the knee joint rather than on the hip joint right and now one another important aspect that we have to discuss here it is actually you know that you have the rectus femoris muscle you have the iliacus you have the psoas major muscle now a patient is on lying down okay he's lying down in his couch and he have to lift his leg the weight of the leg is actually one by six the weight of his lower body so such great load he has to lift and his hip flexors is going to generate a sudden contraction which is may not be when i'm walking my hip flexor may not generate such a great force but to lift from an idle position it has to generate a greater force when that greater force is going to generate actually what is going to happen this hip flexors is going to pull this pelvis anteriorly it will produce the anterior pelvic tilt and when there is an anterior pelvic tilt it can precipitate as an increased lordosis as i already told you that means in this situation there can be hyperlordosis at the spine hyperlordosis at the spine provided your abdominal muscles are weak here we are going to see a link between this hip flexors and abdominals when you have a good abdominal muscle strength this abdominal muscles are going to provide a force that is going to push your pelvis posteriorly or inhibit this anterior tilt of the pelvis anterior pull of the pelvis that is like this when uh, for example when you are uh, having your pelvis like this when you are in the lying down position your hip flexors are going to contract so when my hip flexors contract see this hand can go down this can go for the anterior pelvic tilt right like this but here my abdominals are strong they are going to pull it like this no it won't allow them to go and it will give a stabilizatory effect that will provide a check to the hyperlordosis so in persons who have a good abdominal strength this lordosis may not be precipitated but if you have a weak abdominal muscles nothing is going to check your hip flexor activity purely it is going to tilt your pelvis once the pelvis is tilted along with that abdomen protrudes and here you have a flattened curve increased lumbar lordosis would be there so that is why when you rehabilitate the patients you go for a core strengthening program you strengthen the abdominals you strengthen the back muscles you strengthen the hip muscle flexors and so on this is also an application of the chain system one problem in one pro one site one single aspect of the chain can precipitate problem in other aspects so you train everything but you forget to, to check the abdominal strength it's going to have problems this is not actually going to stabilize this instability can again precipitate problems in your lumbar spine because every time the hip flexor is going for an isolated contraction this pelvic tilt is going to occur and occur it will again cause problem in your lumbar spine so you need to have a compensatory com compensatory rehab not not compensatory you need to have a complete rehabilitative strategy strengthening your abdominal muscles we will discuss this is just a bit of that idea we will discuss the greater deal about in core strengthening and sit up in coming classes so we we'll let us summarize the rectus femoris with that and more about the aspect of the rectus femoris its tightness and so on we'll discuss in the knee joint and now we move on to the next muscle that is the sartorius muscle we just have few more muscles two more muscles to discuss this one is the sartorius muscle you know what, what you know the sartorius muscle sartorius means a slender muscle okay the slender muscle is the longest muscle in the human body right and it is produced in flexion at the hip abduction and lateral rotation at the hip flexion abduction and lateral rotation at the hip you know that the function that is like at the tailor's position that is why this muscle is known as a tailor's muscle in knee joint it's going to produce knee flexion and medial rotation so one of the aspect that you have to think about this sartorius muscle is this muscle is somewhat like this right it is going to insert like this okay 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 the problem is that the physiological cross sectional area of this muscle is very less 
the other muscles uh, like tus femoris or iliacus and psoas major has a greater physiological cross section area but this muscle is going to have or having only a lesser physiological cross section area and there is no greater advantage of the momentum too and it is a two joint muscle so when all these factors are taken into consideration this muscle do not have a dominating role in the hip compared to other muscles but it is a chief hip flexor when compared to the muscles like adductor magnus, adductor longus, etc. Where do you need the sartorius is actually when you need a simultaneous hip and knee flexion. For example, when you are climbing your stairs, your iliacus may be fine, your psoas major may be fine and good, very good. They are going to produce the flexion. But if there is no flexion at your knee joint, it's going to be a problem. So in that conditions, when there is a simultaneous flexion at the hip and the knee, you need the muscle sartorius but its definitive role in the hip joint is under controversy and the studies are going on because of this decreased physiological cross-section areas and increased length of this muscle that is the problem with the sartorius muscle right similarly since it is having a problem a role in the knee joint we'll discuss the pathomechanics in the knee joint itself and the last muscle that we have to discuss is the tensor fascia lata before that, let us just see the diagrams of uh, rectus femoris and the sartorius muscle and the diagram of how the rectus femoris and the hip flexor contraction is actually going to be going to produce anterior pelvic tilt and how the abdominal muscles are going to check that. Here, the, during the hip flexion contracture or during the hip flexion, that is movement from extension to flexion a large amount of contractive force is there in the hip flexors like rectus femoris iliacus and so as shown in the figure it actually uh, produce an anterior pelvic tilt moves the pelvis anteriorly but when there is a normal activation of the abdominal muscles this abdominal muscles is counteracting or uh, checking the anterior tel pelvic tilt by providing a posterior force but in the second diagram when there is reduced activation of the hip um, abdominal muscles the hip flexors alone acts or their action is not checked and it can produce an anterior pelvic tilt when there is an excessive anterior pelvic tilt as a compensatory strategy the body goes for increased lumbar lordosis which is seen clearly in the second picture we are going to discuss the next muscle that is the tensor fascia lata. This is also a two joint muscle and it's, have, it's a primary hip flexor. I told you earlier itself. Now, uh, contrary to the other muscles, other muscles are relatively arising from the anterior aspect of your hip joint. This muscle is in the lateral aspect. Okay, This muscle is in the lateral aspect of the knee joint. Right. Now, this is arising from the iliac crest. Okay, lateral aspect of the iliac crest it is attached to the it band and then it is attached to the tibia you know that you know that uh, the anatomy of that muscle we are not going to discuss the anatomy what is its role this muscle is going to produce flexion abduction and media rotation at the hip joint going to produce flexion abduction and media rotation at the hip joint so you know anatomically what are the action of that muscle Biomechanically speaking, one of the chief action of this tensor fascia lata is more than the mobility, it is providing stability and integrity to the hip joint. Stability and integrity of hip. How? You know that this muscle is located laterally. This muscle is located laterally, right? This like this. Okay what it is actually doing there are two compressive there are two types of stress one is a tensile one and another is compressive one compressive one is going to press the joint like this and the bones in our human body is very adapted to act against this compressive load but not against this tensile load the bone is not that well adapted to go for the tensile load and this IT band due to this unique location, the tensor fascia lata, is helping in dissipating the tensile load. So when it dissipates the tensile load, it is actually helping the bone to maintain its integrity. So the bone is having a less challenge. Otherwise, it has to compensate, it has to work against a tensile load for which it has no natural capacity. 
So this tensile load on this hip joint, weight bearing time, this load is actually compensated or checked it to a greater degree by your IT band or the tensor facial actor. Of course, you have the tensile compressed trabecular systems, that's there. But along with that, this ten ten tensor facial actor is biomechanically helping this knee joint, help hip joint to maintain its structure integrity and the stability at the knee joint. So that is the most important biomechanical function. It is a flexor of the hip joint, it is an abductor, it is a medial rotator. That's fine. Along with that, the biomechanical of this muscle is having a unique function of maintaining the structural integrity. And tightness in structure TFL, you know that it is going to produce a limitation in adduction. And you test it with the obverse test and modified obverse test, which we will study in the which we will discuss in the next coming video which is purely about the practical of the psoas major muscle, iliacus, quads, the rectus femoris, sartorius and the TFL. There we will discuss. But I want to give you one more thing that is like you call a snapping hip syndrome. Snapping hip syndrome. This is a particular condition where during the motion of hip flexion this TFL is going to move from anterior from the anterior aspect of the uh, greater trochanter to the lesser aspect from the anterior to posterior this is going to actually flip and that is going to produce some sounds like a popping sound or a snapping sound in hip flexion this is more common in athletic population due to this constant constant friction and activity this muscle is going to be pulled from anterior aspect to the posterior again posterior to anterior aspect that condition is mostly due to the tfl problem and that is known as a snapping hip syndrome okay or the problem in tfl can produce another serious complication the trochanteric bursitis the constant friction in the tfl can cause trochanteric bursitis so that's all about the TFL, where we have to know the biomechanical function and the common function served, that is a flexion, abduction, and media rotation, along with that maintains the stability of the joint. And a clinical condition related to this is the snapping hip syndrome, right? And there is the rest of the muscles, which are the secondary hip flexors, adductor longus, magnus, pectineus, and the gracilis muscle. All these muscles are helping in the flexion that is they have a chief other role they are all adductor compartment muscles so they are prim primarily involved in adduction along with that they help in flexion they help up to 40 to 50 degree of flexion not more than that the maximum flexion that is assisted by the secondary hip flexors is the 40 to 50 remember this 40 to 50 because tomorrow uh, sorry in the next video we are going to do the practicals then we need to remember this 40 to 50 to isolate the action of iliopsoas or iliacus and psoas and rectus femoris muscle so the secondary hip flexors is going to help the flexion but only up to a 40 to 50 degree with this we wind up the hip flexor discussion in a brief manner of course there is dynamic and diverse conditions related to this but to the time of shortage of time we cannot discuss that if you need any more clarity or if you have any doubts or you need in-depth knowledge into this click back uh, get back to me in my instagram profile or facebook page i will be most happy to help you and if you have liked the video and really find it informative please don't forget to subscribe and click the like button stay tuned to see you in the next class that next video that is on the practical aspects of this muscles